man and machines. What is it that makes us so obsessed with them? We tinker, we polish, we caress. We love them. And yet, you know, the engine that's probably had more influence on the history of the world this century, the most simple, the most powerful, the most reliable engine in the history of engineering is very much the Cinderella of the piece. If you think the silicon chip has revolutionized the 20th century, then think again. Surfing the net has nothing on a fighter plane doing Mach 2 at sea level, or a fully laden 747 doing 500 miles an hour at 35,000 feet. In little over half a century, the jet engine has achieved legendary status in a truly global sense. And yet, for all its brilliance, it is treated with virtual disregard by the people who use it. And it has certainly never entered that area where the boiler suit and spanner reign supreme. The jet, it has to be said, has a bit of a personality problem. Never in the field of human transportation has such a near miraculous improvement been so cruelly neglected. The jet engine is the liberal democrat of the engineering world. Bags of hot air, but nobody's terribly fond of them. But the amazing thing is that had it not been for the efforts of one man, we might not have had the jet at all. A young RAF cadet and motorcyclist called Frank Whittle. Back in the 1920s, getting around was all about oily smells, filthy hands, and plotting your trip from one garage to the next. And we're not just talking motorcycles here. This is the Avro 504. It was the basic training plane for fighter pilots between the middle of the First World War and about the late 20s. It's made of wooden spars and ribs covered in cloth and then doped. It runs on a big piston engine, which is lubricated by castor oil. And the engine had two settings, on and off. It's interesting, but it's not exactly what you'd call sophisticated. Which is exactly what Frank Whittle thought. Whittle was a flying ace and was well aware of what the 504 was capable of. However, despite pushing it to its limits, he knew deep down that the propeller plane had some fundamental problems. And so at the age of 21, he outlined these problems in an astonishing student essay. Basically, in order to fly at any great speed, an aeroplane has to go high, where the air is thinner and there is less drag. However, precisely because the air is thinner, the propeller gets less grip and is less effective. As if that wasn't bad enough, as the air gets thinner, the aeroplane's engine also gets less and less efficient. Their propeller plane was trapped. What an absolutely delicious noise. Absolutely lovely, at least to those of us who've got a closet full of anoraks and the big toolbox mark, do not touch. However, to Frank Whittle, it was just the noise of wasted energy, literally wasted petrol. He wanted to get rid of all those clattering moving parts and produce one solid thrust. And that's what he set about designing. Now, kiddies, don't try this at home. Newton's third law of motion states that for every action in the universe, there is an equal and opposite reaction, which is why this is going round because all the thrust coming out the back is producing a forward thrust by the plane. This is the basis of jet propulsion. But unlike the firework, a true engine has to be able to control the thrust. So with virtually no help from the government and the RAF, who both thought he was bananas, Whittle set off to create a controllable stream of thrust. At least that was the plan. But despite a few teething troubles, the principle of the jet engine was established. This, believe it or not, is a very primitive turbine. And what's happening is that the heat's rising up and these blades, which are angled like so, as the heat comes up, they try and avoid it and move away from it. As they move away from it, of course, because they're all in the same shape, they eventually produce a spinning motion. Turbines were around, of course, a long time before Whittle. But his genius was, that he took the turbine at the end, put it on one shaft, 
and at the front drove a compressor. And it doesn't make a really irritating noise that makes you wish you were a Buddhist. There we go, watch this now. The compressor is basically a huge fan that sucks air into the engine and squeezes it into an explosive mixture with the fuel. This then ignites and goes scooshing out the back, creating forward thrust and turning the turbine on its way. Because they're both connected to the same shaft, the turbine then turns the compressor again, so completing the cycle. Are we going to get surrounded by rescue helicopters? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whittle's jet engine first took to the air in May 1941. You might have thought that a country at war would be interested in a plane that would do over 300 miles an hour without a propeller, but incredibly, the test flight was met with willful disinterest from the British government. It was early days, and of course you had the power and clout of the combustion engine industry. Yes. Which was vast, and Frank was doing something which nobody believed that would ever happen. Really? Yes. I mean, a boy to write a thesis at 21, yes. um, putting aircraft at speeds of 350 or 400 miles an hour yes. at 35,000 feet, when uh, the standard fighter was 150 miles an hour, yes. you can imagine that it was a very difficult job that he had to do. In a way, you could see their point. Who couldn't love the Spitfire with its big Merlin V12 engine and its propeller thrashing the air to a foam? Which is one of the jet's enduring drawbacks. While the piston and propeller combination sounds all fruity and delicious, the jet is cold, inscrutable, and sounds like something at the back of your fridge. By the end of the war, the government relented and ordered up a squadron of Gloucester Meteors, the first jet plane to be enrolled in the Air Force. But even then, the response from the pilots was less than enthusiastic. The thing I found about the Meteor, of course, was that if you were in a typhoon or a tempest and you opened the throttle wide, yes. it kicked you up the backside, the yes. aircraft. You yes. went, woof! Yeah. Not so. Really? I've always been a bit of a propeller fan myself, but you know what they say, don't knock it till you've tried it. Well, that's, that's about right, isn't it? Yeah. Uh. You see what I mean? Every time I get the chance to do something remotely butch, they make me wear a silly hat. It's a conspiracy. Yep. Gas mark five for half an hour. Yep, let's do it. Although the Meteor's engines pointed straight towards the future, its airframe construction was firmly rooted in the past. The bodywork is pure 1940s with lots of wires and wooden bits, more of an MG than a Mazda. Accordingly, it has to be flown with a certain amount of respect. No showing off. Or at least that's what I was told. The early meteors may not have won many friends amongst the propeller boys, but it wasn't long before the jet found its feet. By the time they'd created the Mark V model in 1946, the meteor was doing over 600 miles an hour. And no amount of pistons and propellers can argue with that.
we go for another spin, mister? I've got another ten shillings. It had been a long haul for the jet, but by the end of the war, the end was nigh for the piston-engine propeller plane. Now all the jet had to do was to achieve world domination.